In 2015, less than a year before her death, author Harper Lee published her second novel, Go Set a Watchman, a sequel to her first and only other published novel, 1960's To Kill a Mockingbird. Though the book was published 55 years after To Kill a Mockingbird, it is generally accepted now that Go Set a Watchman was actually written concurrent to or even before To Kill a Mockingbird. And in the process of writing To Kill a Mockingbird, rather than encouraging her to create the entire omnibus, the publisher urged Lee to focus on the childhood aspect, and not on Scout becoming an adult and growing into a more complete understanding of who her father, Atticus Finch, was. Generations of people had grown up with Atticus Finch, played with such power and pathos by Gregory Peck in the 1962 film adaptation, only to then have the author swoop in 55 years later and remove the halo adorning Atticus Finch. There is some debate as to whether or not the publisher took advantage of Harper Lee given her age and the fact that she may not have been in possession of her full faculties when Go Set a Watchman was published, but it is kind of out there now that Go Set a Watchman was always kind of a part of her authorial intent. To Kill a Mockingbird was written from the point of view of an adult reflecting the understanding of a child, but Go Set a Watchman changed the framing of Atticus, allowing for a more complete picture of the worldview of white landowners in the South, even the nicest ones. Atticus wasn't an activist, he wasn't terribly concerned with the plight of black Americans in the gym Crow South. He was just a really good lawyer who got appointed this guy's public defender, and he didn't want to lose a case. That Go Set a Watchman brought Atticus Finch, the moral pillar of American literature, down to the level of flawed human was heresy to some. Atticus was integral to the childhoods of so many. Why? Why add this unasked for perspective? Why did you ruin Atticus, Harper Lee? Why did you do it? And I get that you're wondering why in an episode about The Hobbit, the intro is about Harper Lee and Go Set a Watchman. Well, we'll get to that. But first... <laughs> the Lord of the Rings, the Fellowship of the Ring is so good it makes me angry. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Arnor. Like this was lightning in a bottle. We will never see anything like this again. This was back when franchises were a gamble, and Fellowship had a massive gun to its head to do well or sink not only the rest of the franchise, but also everyone involved's career. It had to be great. And the result was so tight and streamlined that not only did it become one of the most lucrative trilogies in film history, it changed film itself. Eleven years passed, and the Lord of the Rings film still elicited positive feelings. Mostly. Then came the Hobbit trilogy. At the time, consensus was that these movies were, at best, a mediocre bloated mess with some enjoyable moments. Having as intimate a knowledge as I did with the source material and the first film trilogy, I was pretty disillusioned from the get-go, bored to death by the first one and by that point already tapped out, seeing the second one in theaters only out of a morbid sense of obligation and not bothering at all with the third film. But The Lord of the Rings came out at a particularly formative time in my development. I said back in 2012 that it was the first film trilogy that got me actively interested in filmmaking, and that is true, but that in itself is a form of bias. I wanted The Hobbit to make me feel like The Lord of the Rings did when I was a kid, and it didn't, so I hated it. 
Why does it hurt so much? Because it was real. It's been nearly 17 years since Fellowship and six years since the release of the first Hobbit film. So maybe now is the time to re-examine The Hobbit. You cannot disentangle it from The Lord of the Rings. The film itself doesn't want you to. But maybe I was judging The Hobbit for what it wasn't, rather than what it was. So let's re-examine The Hobbit. Let's try and give it a fair shake. Da, why are there dwarves climbing out of our toilet? You are a coward. Coward? Not every man's brave enough to wear a cool seat. If that's even possible. The Hobbit trilogy was released between 2012 and 2014 under the subtitles An Unexpected Journey, The Desolation of Smaug, and The Battle of Five Armies. The creative team behind The Hobbit is almost uniformly the same as that from The Lord of the Rings, with one curious addition. For better or worse, you're as known for the movie you didn't do, The Hobbit, as the ones that you did. We'll get to that. A huge chunk of the cast returned to reprise their roles from Lord of the Rings, most notably Ian McKellen as Gandalf, Andy Serkis as Gollum, and Hugo Weaving as Elrond, and adding in not-in-the-Hobbit-Rings characters such as Legolas, Saruman, Galadriel, and even Frodo. And Radagast is here too. But that is not to imply that none of the new elements for The Hobbit were bad. Far from it, some of them were inspired. Martin Freeman as Bilbo is pitch-perfect casting. Incineration. Freeman has spent much of his entire career since the original office playing the put upon every man. Come on, come on, watch, 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 watch. And that layer of wit combined with his innate sincerity works really well here. The opening scene with Gandalf and Bilbo, after roughly 20 minutes of prologue anyway, is almost verbatim from the book. McKellen perfectly bridges the whimsical, mercurial, difficult Gandalf of The Hobbit with the serious business Gandalf of Rings. You know my name. Oh, you don't remember I belong to it. I'm Gandalf. And Gandalf means... me. There are also some story changes that improve the overall film. For instance, having the choice to go on the adventure be Bilbo's idea, rather than Gandalf effectively forcing him into it. I'm going on an adventure! Benedict Cumberbatch's Smaug is honestly one of his career highlights. And I wish I had as much fun at anything in my life as Cumberbatch does playing Smaug. How do you choose to die? The scene where Bilbo and Smaug talk for the first time, at least until it starts going on for way too long, ranks alongside any of the best scenes from Rings. And do you now? Adding in small details like Smaug being able to see Bilbo, which he couldn't in the book, is another positive change that just adds more drama to the scene. Even Lee Pace as Thranduil brings a sort of otherworldly dimension to a character in the book who is just, you know, some greedy jerk. It was also necessary to develop Bard as a character before he kills Smaug. In the book, he's just an ascended extra with no lines before he shows up with his bow to kill the dragon. There are dozens more great details I could go into. The elves only eating, like, kale. The dwarves being horrified by that. Try it. Just a mouthful. I don't like green food. Even Gimli's gratuitous cameo doesn't bother me. What is this horrid creature? A goblin mutant. That's my wee lad, Gimli. The problem with The Hobbit isn't the absence of good. Good in it exists. It is more the whole weighing less than the sum of its parts. These positive elements are often used as refutations of criticism of The Hobbit. But to say that the presence of good outweighs the pacing issues, the unnecessary plot cul-de-sacs, the terrible visual effects, the clumsy integration of irrelevant plot points. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, uh, I'm starting to remember why these movies frustrated me so much. The Hobbit was published 20 years before The Lord of the Rings was published, and itself had to be reissued to fit with the new version of Middle-earth Tolkien created, and even still is tonally a completely different animal from The Lord of the Rings. Meanwhile, The Hobbit movies have the opposite problem, billed as prequels to movies that had come out a decade prior. Add into this the popularity of all parties involved. The Hobbit is one of the best-selling books of all time, at over 100 million copies, shy of Lord of the Rings' 150-odd million copies. So on the one hand, the filmmakers are tasked with creating faithful adaptations of one of the best 
best-selling books of all time. On the other hand, the filmmakers are tasked with creating prequels to one of the best-selling film trilogies of all time. So roadblock number one, The Lord of the Rings was written as a sequel to The Hobbit. The Hobbit was not written as a prequel to Lord of the Rings. And we have to be faithful to both, but in publication order, the prequel was not a prequel. It wasn't even originally planned to have any sequels, and as a consequence, the central conflict of The Hobbit, dwarves finding a treasure and then a bunch of people fighting over it, has nothing to do with the central conflict of The Lord of the Rings, which is that the magic ring Bilbo found on his adventure oops it's evil and will destroy the world. Compare this with the Star Wars prequels, which, love them or hate them, you are the chosen one! Their central conflicts do directly set up the plots of the original Star Wars trilogy. How the Empire formed, how Anakin Skywalker became Darth Vader, what the Clone Wars were, the gang's all here. The Hobbit doesn't really work as a prequel to The Lord of the Rings because neither the conflict nor the tone flow into it. If they really wanted to do a prequel to The Lord of the Rings, one that set up the universe, how the magic rings worked, how they came into existence, who Sauron is and where he came from, why he had control over the Rings of Power. The real prequel to The Lord of the Rings with a similar epic tone was The Silmarillion. Said Tolkien himself of The Lord of the Rings in a letter to his publisher, it's not really a sequel to The Hobbit, but to The Silmarillion. But that wasn't The Lord of the Rings prequel anyone wanted. We ain't gonna adapt no dense, myth-heavy Silmarillion with its paltry less than a million copies sold. Oh no, precious. We wanted The Hobbit. Fair enough. The truth is, The Hobbit existing in the same universe and having to logically progress into The Lord of the Rings presented huge problem for Tolkien. And a lot of what we know is The Hobbit wasn't there in the original publication. Tolkien made dozens of tiny changes for the 1951 reissue of The Hobbit preceding the original printing of The Lord of the Rings, but the biggest change was an almost total rewrite of Riddles in the Dark. In the original version, Gollum was a much more quirky, less sinister character, and he gave Bilbo the ring as a gift when Bilbo won the riddle contest. The One Ring was not yet the One Ring, it was just a magic ring that would be really useful. A nice magic ring, but there was no intent to flow into something more epic. The necromancer that Gandalf uses as an excuse to leave the dwarves at Mirkwood we find out in The Lord of the Rings that that was sour on the whole time, and oh boy, oh boy, do they play that up in the Hobbit movies. This character, of course, was not originally intended to be Sauron. The Necromancer, according to Tolkien, was hardly more than to provide a reason for Gandalf going away and leaving Bilbo and the dwarves to fend for themselves, which was necessary for the tale. So I get why people defend that decision on the part of the filmmakers to include Sauron, but to state that that was Tolkien's original intent, that's pretty disingenuous. But the biggest problem was in keeping the same plot while making The Hobbit, also a tonal prequel to The Lord of the Rings. The Hobbit, the novel, has a wildly different tone from The Lord of the Rings. The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings take place in the same universe, but only nominally. Many, if not most, of the details of the history of Middle-earth existed only in sketch form, and Tolkien's beloved Silmarillion, which, yes, he'd started even before The Hobbit was published, would change dramatically as Tolkien developed The Lord of the Rings. But when The Hobbit was a success, and Tolkien's publisher asked for a sequel, Tolkien didn't really know where he wanted to go with it. It took him several years to realize that the world of The Hobbit had effectively grown up when his children did, and he wanted to write an epic fantasy for adults. Because The Lord of the Rings both didn't hit the original target audience, children, but then again, it did. Part of the reason why The Lord of the Rings feels more grown up is because his kids, and by extension the original kids who read it when it was published, were growing up with the stories, and Tolkien's oldest son Christopher was integral to the creation of the book. The Hobbit was a children's story written before any serious publisher would dare entertain the idea of epic fantasy literature for adults. It was published at a time where fantasy was either Le Petit Prince or Beowulf, and The Lord of the Rings, even 20 years later, was kind of a huge gamble, one that paid off right away and has never been out of print since. Tolkien wrote to a fan in 1955 it remains an unfailing delight to me to find my own belief justified that the fairy story is really an adult genre and one for which a starving audience exists. Both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings were stories for Tolkien's children, but at different stages of life. So, you can either make a faithful adaptation of The Hobbit, one that is fun and clever and matches the childlike tone of the books, which were designed to be read aloud at story time and even include quick asides for the reader, or you can make three three-hour prequels to Lord of the Rings that match the tone and epic scope of The Lord of the Rings. But they can't be the same thing. The Hobbit is about 95,000 words long, about 5,000 words shorter than the first Hunger Games book, and about 12,000 words longer than the first Harry Potter book. 
To compare, The Fellowship of the Ring alone is nearly twice that length at 177,000 words, with the entirety of The Lord of the Rings cashing in at about 1.5 Games of Thrones, and that doesn't even include the appendices. This is not to say that The Hobbit needed to be the same length as the first Hunger Games movie in order not to feel flabby. The Hobbit has an extremely minimalistic style for all that goes down in it, compared with the florid Lord of the Rings with its extreme attention to detail. Adapting The Hobbit as it is without adding any pauses for character development or pacing or world building would have made a film that felt incredibly rushed. Even though the book is Hunger Games short, a lot more goes down in it, and it would feel way too rushed as a 90-minute movie, or even one three-hour movie. So I think the initial pitch of two two-hour movies directed by Guillermo del Toro could have led to the creation of a great, original, memorable product, both in the spirit of the original novel, yet distinct from the Lord of the Rings film trilogy. Why does it hurt so much? Because it was real. <sighs> Maybe they got that version of the Berenstain universe. To explore the challenges of adapting The Hobbit, first we must examine the structure. It has a beginning, middle, and end, kinda, but it doesn't really have the structure of a Hollywood screenplay, let alone three Hollywood screenplays. Compared to The Fellowship of the Ring, the book doesn't really have a three-act structure per se, but without changing much, the film gets rid of the Tom Bombadil stuff, good call that, has the end of Act 1 as Frodo leaving the Shire, and also has a really long Act 2, with the midpoint being Frodo taking the ring to Mordor. I will take the ring to Mordor and Act 3 comprising a big action scene where Frodo escapes while Aragorn and the others fight the uruk and Boromir gets a much more emotional death than he does in the book. Not a whole lot of rearranging needed to turn this into a three-act Hollywood structure. But The Hobbit is way more episodic, with the individual adventures rarely changing the quest. The book pulls a great deal from English folk tales, fairy stories, epics, and Norse poems like Beowulf, so it includes elements that might otherwise feel out of place in a novel because of the story's basis. Plot points that feel out of nowhere or anticlimactic, like Ascended Extra Bard killing the dragon instead of Bilbo or the dwarves, or Smaug having one weakness, is very rooted in mythology and folk stories. Fafnir, Beowulf, Odysseus, and as it ends up in the movies, boy is it anticlimactic. <laughs> This did not need to be so hideously anticlimactic, except for the way that they structured it. The third movie begins with the burning of Lake Town, and Smaug dies before the opening title. This, like so many things, is a consequence of restructuring. Smaug's death should have been the midpoint of the second film, not the, um, prologue to the third? The structure of The Hobbit is episodic and meandering, not a lot of build like we see in The Lord of the Rings. Each chapter is a mini-adventure in which Bilbo either learns something, gets something, or earns respect. It is effectively designed to be read by adults two children, one chapter per night. The Leonard Nimoy Ode to Bilbo Baggins song captures this pretty well. Well, he fought with the goblins. He battled the troll. He riddled with Gollum. The decision to split this book into three makes this into even more of a problem because we need to split this tiny book into Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3 three times. This results in adding mini climaxes that don't go anywhere, character moments that come either too early or too late, and several elements that just don't translate. Bilbo has nothing to do during the Battle of Five Armies and is unconscious for most of it. This isn't so much a problem in the book as the Battle of Five Armies takes up all of like half a chapter, but they went and made it take two hours of a two hour and 44 minute movie that relegates Bilbo into a minor role and most of the dwarves as glorified extras. But the worst problems don't arise because the book was a challenge to adapt. There is a good movie in this mess, if you edit out, like, half of it. It's the horrible structure problems that arise from the decision to split two films into three a matter of months before the first film was set to be released. So character beats need to be shuffled around not only according to the needs of adaptation, but according to the needs of film structures. So this moment, where Thorin finally respects Bilbo, happens here. I have never been so wrong. No, no. Rather than after Bilbo frees the dwarves in the barrels, where it was likely originally intended to have happened and where it makes more sense to have happened, because Bilbo had repeatedly proven himself to Thorin by that point. But in the final version, where Thorin has to respect Bilbo before the eagles rescue them, the one action Bilbo gets is to bum rush an orc, like a linebacker. <laughs> And it makes that plot point weaker because Bilbo freeing the dwarves through his cunning and magic ring is what makes him valuable to the party. He doesn't think like them, and his wits are his greatest asset. So his prove myself to Thorin moment being like a football tackle just makes a rushed moment all the weaker. Bilbo's not a linebacker. 
He's a hobbit. He's the hobbit. And now Bilbo and Thorin's relationship has zero development throughout movie two. It's just kind of at a par, and then they have their falling out in three. When you decided to make uh, three instead of two movies, mm -hmm. isn't it hard to um, split a story arc uh, from two into three? Well, it was actually better. I mean, we, 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 we made that decision because it was going to be, we felt it was going to be a better shape. I mean, it, it, it was our decision. It wasn't a studio decision. Really? Really? I find that very hard to believe. The original first film was set to end once the party got to either Erebor or Lake Town. Part two would have been getting into Erebor, everything with Smaug, and then five armies. So the nonsense climaxes of movies one and two, which involves so much. What? What? Are, dw are dwarves heat res- Metal doesn't- What? What? The need for these contrived climaxes that add nothing to the overall narrative directly trace back to that 11th hour decision to turn two movies into three, because all movies are trilogies now. Is this two or three? Oh, it's three, is it? Is this three? Yeah. It's three. There you go. It's that easy to be confused. And then there was the stuff they added. Oh, and the stuff they added. Aren't you going to search me? I could have anything down my trousers. Again, to compare to The Lord of the Rings, because we have to, they cut just as much out of the novels as they added into the films, and most of what they added was some expansion on material from the appendices, most notably Aragorn and Arwen. At the front, when Arwen rescues Frodo, is more of a change rather than an addition, and again a positive one in my opinion. In the book, Frodo is rescued by a character who never appears again, so making it Aragorn's one true love makes that plot point stronger. In The Two Towers, they also added a warg battle and Aragorn getting separated and a bunch of scenes with Arwen, and Arwen leaving and then coming back. Frodo and Sam have a tiff in The Return of the King, which, you know, I'm not a fan of, but I, I guess I get, well, get why they got it. The Gollum framing Sam, which is kind of dumb, but okay. And then there's the scene at Asgiliath at the end of Two Towers that gives Frodo and Sam a climax in the second movie. And those are kind of like the only major additions. They cut out a few chapters, like Tom Bombadil and The Scouring of the Shire entirely, but they didn't add that much in the grand scheme. Here's some of the stuff they added to The Hobbit. The White Council, this orc mini-boss who's in all three films, fighting dragon priests. Evangeline Lily, Legolas fighting, that endlessly long barrel rubber chase scene between orcs and elves and we're fighting. Keely's hot and he's in love. Gandalf and Galadriel, huh? Yeah, Legolas fighting. Radagast the Brown. He's got poop on his head. Useless framing device. The entire climax of desolation. Evangeline Lily is in a love triangle. Legolas is so Wow, this cool. framing device sure is going on forever. Bilbo linebacker. Did they fuck? Side quest to Angmar that goes nowhere. Stephen Fry's horrible henchman. What is happening? On screen White Council scene. God, Alfred is awful. Look at Legolas go. Bard the Bowman has a fan. Family now. Bjorn needed a bear chase scene. Come with me, my lady. Gandalf, she's married. Gratuitous Elijah Wood cameo. True love. And that's like not even half of it. This ties in with other adaptational problems, namely the problem of The Hobbit being so different and more childlike, read cartoonish, in tone than the more gritty adult Lord of the Rings. First, the Battle of Five Armies. Just all of it. It takes up about half a chapter and Bilbo is unconscious, so of course this needed to be expanded. But the result is longer than the Battle of Helm's Deep, which itself started to drag in the run-up. But do not trust to hope. There is no hope. There is still hope. We get it. They say that it is hopeless. We get it. Another consequence of splitting two movies into three is that movie two needs a climax now. And that is how we got the escape from Smaug scene and the heat-resistant dwarves. It adds a gratuitous action scene that goes on forever, but adds absolutely nothing to the narrative plot-wise. Smaug was going to go destroy Lake Town either way, so this action scene is bereft of tension in every regard. This is a problem in a lot of recent films. Studio will mandate X number of action scenes, but these action scenes either have no tension either in the macro sense of how they advance the plot, or in the momentary sense of whether the characters get through or not and whether we, the audience, care. This is particularly problematic in that the dwarves seem utterly resistant to dragon fire and to heat in general. So there is no physical danger to them, so... 
why... Thorin? Thorin, you know metal is a conductor, right? There is a similar problem in the scene where the dwarves escape the elves. It has a plot-related tension of escape, but the action is so absurd that you can't really feel for these guys. They appear to be made of rubber. They don't seem to have any mortality. Healy gets shot by an arrow, and that's sad and hurts him. But meanwhile, this is happening. <laughs> and cartoons barrel boing boing all in the same scene. Are these guys impervious or not? And if they are impervious, then where's the tension? And then there was the storm giants. This is no thunderstorm, it's a thunder battle! Oh, the storm giants. So like Five Armies takes up about half a chapter, the storm giants, a five minute scene, takes up about half a sentence. Here's the sentence. And according to the annotated Hobbit, most Tolkien scholars don't think of storm giants as like alternate fantasy creatures that we haven't seen yet. They're, you know, they're just trolls. Cave trolls, troll trolls, trolls that like to play in the rain and throw rocks. You know, the fun kind of troll, not the internet kind. But speaking of cave troll, there is a scene in the Fellowship that this reminds me of. We're in the mines of Moria. We've just found out how Balin and all of the dwarves there died. They're coming. And then Pippin inadvertently causes an extended action scene that goes on for about 20 minutes and ends with Gandalf's death. You see what I mean about action scenes should advance the plot? No! Anyway. Fool of a took. Before this scene, we've set up the Mithril armor. Mithril. As light as a feather. And as hard as dragon scales. Which Bilbo got from Thorin in The Hobbit and gives to Frodo. During the scene, Frodo gets stabbed by the troll. Everyone's like, oh no, he dead, but ah uh, wait, remember that Mithril armor. Mithril. So with the storm giant scene, again we're straining believability by oscillating between the mortal, Bilbo hanging from a ledge and needing a rescue, and the cartoonish, literally everything else in the scene. The legends are true! Giants! Storm giants! It culminates in this moment. They're on the knee of a giant who ostensibly smashes them into the side of a cliff. No! Uh, but no, they're fine. See, they're fine. Whatever, let's go. <laughs> Unlike the troll scene in Fellowship, where Frodo reveals the Mithril armor, there is no payoff here. No one's skill that had been set up in an earlier scene saves them. It's just a wildly unlikely coincidence that they survive action that goes nowhere and advances nothing. So, unlike with Rings, where we have a constant sense of mortality and the physical pain these characters are going through, in The Hobbit it's like action figures being smashed together. There's never any real sense of danger. When they get caught by goblins, Gandalf shows up and they cut through them like butter. And to be clear, this is not about knowing what the outcome of the scene is just because you've read the book. You can still feel tension as an audience member, even if you already know what the outcome of the scene is. And there's nothing wrong with a playful, cartoony tone in and of itself, but it's really hard to include that in a narrative that also has these dramatic moments of physical danger. If this doesn't kill them, and that doesn't kill them, and that doesn't kill them, then what would? In order to maintain tension, the rules of the universe have to be consistent, and we need to believe that these characters are in danger. It goes without saying Bilbo and Gandalf surviving, for instance, is a foregone conclusion that can't be helped, but there are ways to build tension in an already popular story. Fellowship of the Ring takes a character like Boromir, and it fleshes him out with an understandable personal conflict in friendship with the hobbits, so that when he does die, it feels way more upsetting and meaningful and, well, human than it did in the book. Tolkien didn't really care about Boromir as a character, but Jackson and his co-writers keyed into his humanity, and the result is one of the strongest, most memorable performances in all three films. The entire character of Boromir is an excellent example of the way movies can improve upon their source material. Leave it. It is over. But these are all style choices. To me, the biggest issue with the Hobbit movies was instead of letting the movies be the Hobbit... <laughs> The biggest mess in all three films is the attempt to make the central conflict in The Hobbit directly tied in with the central conflict of The Lord of the Rings. Because it just isn't, except maybe in that really, really distant Silmarillion way where all bad things, like dragons and orcs, etc., all originate from the same bad one dude. By the way, if you want to go down a fun rabbit hole, Google image search Sauron Melkor fan art, it is a trip. 
Even in Tolkien's awkward retrofit where we find out that the necromancer was Sauron the whole time, it's almost completely irrelevant to the conflict in The Hobbit. Gandalf mentions that Sauron is over here somewhere in the Fellowship of the Ring, but it doesn't really mean anything to either narrative except for helping Gandalf put two and two together when Bilbo starts acting weird. You want it for yourself! Bilbo Baggins! So their solution was to double down on what was, even to Tolkien, kind of a contrived throwaway line to get Gandalf out of the picture. Now, now, I'm already late because of bothering with you. It works in a children's story, but when you take a plot device to get Gandalf away from the party and then try to develop it into this lush world building. Are you in need of assistance, my lady? Still, there had to be a better way to make this work. Ultimately, there is a rising darkness in the form of the goblins and the dragons, and the whole thrust of the battle at the end is everyone fighting each other over a petty treasure when there is a real existential threat to all of them. See, the reveal of the necromancer's identity doesn't actually matter in this story because he doesn't really do anything. This only matters to the audience who recognizes this character from Lord of the Rings. What it is in the book is Gandalf's discovery of the orc army, which we later find out is commanded by Sauron. If we wanted to keep Sauron here, sure, have it be that angle. But the problem is they're already being pursued by orcs from the minute go, way before we learn that the necromancer is Sauron. A different orc army, not to be confused with this orc army, you know, the one with the worms of Arrakis. But as it is in the final product, the reveal of Sauron is completely meaningless. But it could have flown in better thematically into The Lord of the Rings. Darkness rising, stop fighting over stupid shit, y'all. It's only gonna get worse. But more focus is placed on shoehorning in these plot elements and characters from rings, which makes it just feel flabby and awkward. There's one bit in the appendices with Christopher Lee that breaks my heart a little bit. If it means something in the story, and it's what the director wants. So you're using the staff in the hand like, like so, yep, yep, per perfect. And the audience remembers it. That's what it's all about. He and Jackson kind of parted on bad terms after The Lord of the Rings since Sauron's conclusion was cut from Return of the King in the theatrical cut, but he is here for this, and he's excited to be here. And he loves this idea of playing pre-corruption Saruman and going after Sauron. Leave Sauron to me. One of the very few good moments in the Battle of Five Armies. Leave Sauron to me. And he means it. And this just it makes me sad, because that idea, that angle, that passion that Lee has, in a scene that on the whole is so unnecessary and confusing and goofy, and Gandalf and Galadriel, what are you doing? Perhaps in another life, if only wizards and elves could procreate. It's just wasted here. And that, I think, is the essence of these movies. Moments of brilliance wasted in a product that, on the whole, tries to have it all ways and in the process just pulls itself apart at the seams. But there's one element in particular, a small one, but it, to me it encapsulates the clumsily slapped together new ending to movie one. It's not the Bilbo bum rush, but this right here. Did you catch it? Here, I'll play it again. That's... That's the Ring Ray theme. <laughs> like, you know, things mean things. Musical motifs especially mean things. That wasn't Sauron's theme, it wasn't Gollum's theme. That was, specifically, the Ringwraith theme from Fellowship. I know you know this, Howard Shore, Peter Jackson, Philip Boyens, all of whom put so much thought and effort into the Lord of the Rings. You explained it to me back in 2001. Revelation of the Ringwraith is a poem that Philip Boyens wrote. As in the case of this, it was translated into Andunaic, which was the ancient speech of man. And here you are just slapping on whatever ominous sounding music because you decided it should be three films in October and it's being released in December and Howard Shore didn't have time to compose something new. I get that they didn't have the time that they had for Rings and Jackson didn't really want to direct and he was typed out and exhausted the whole time. But it really shows. 
So maybe it isn't just my nostalgia that it didn't do it for me the way The Lord of the Rings did. There's just so much that doesn't work here, and it's pretty easy to pinpoint. The question is, why? It isn't like some outside studio hack swooped in and took over. The Hobbit has almost entirely the same creative team and the same cast as The Lord of the Rings. We are uh, we're very much going to be the same storytellers to making this sort of six series story, six, six film series. There are some genuinely great creative choices unique to this trilogy, and the new cast is both brilliant and distinct from the cast of The Lord of the Rings, when they aren't characters from The Lord of the Rings that are awkwardly shoehorned in anyway. And yet, I kind of long for death. I recall looking back at the extended DVDs of The Lord of the Rings, how watching all those extras inspired interest and passion in the filmmaking process and added an extra layer of enjoyment to the films themselves. Seeing how by no means no, the making of The Lord of the Rings was not easy, but everyone was here for it. And that passion comes through in the final product. And I look at The Hobbit and I'm just, I'm just tired. Like, I see these extra features, the care and pain taken to create what was brought to the screen, that each movie has 10 hours of extras, and I'm just like, I don't care. And I find myself struggling to remember what moved me so deeply about The Lord of the Rings in the first place if so many of the elements are in effect the same. These movies just, they make me feel drained. I don't hate them, I just, I feel nothing. And I find myself unable to remember why I was so passionate about The Lord of the Rings and the works of Tolkien in the first place. Is there a way to ungrow up, be like young Scout Finch, see through that naive worldview where we can look up to the things that we loved as kids and absolutes? Can you ever really go home again? Or must we all, like Frodo, eventually go into the West? The reason why some of us respond so emotionally to media is because media helped shape us as kids. We all have a first love in movies, and The Lord of the Rings was one of mine. So no matter how, quote, mature, end quote, you become in your consumption of media, there's always going to be some part of you that desires not to see your childhood passions through the eyes of an adult, but instead to recapture what ignited our passions as kids. But maybe, now that I'm an adult with an expendable income, I can make a journey to find the answers to my questions, and see if perhaps that magic can be recaptured. Lindsay, wait! Go back, Nilla. I'm going to New Zealand alone. Of course you are, and I'm coming with you. So here we are, in Hobbiton. Well, the movie set fictionally known as Hobbiton. In New Zealand, trying to recapture the lost magic of our childhoods. It comes easier to some of us. I'm going on an adventure! Nella, you were 28 when that movie came out. Anyway, 
<sighs> this, this, this isn't so bad. I mean, yeah, it's a little exploitative, but you know, this is this is actually kind of fun. This is pretty fun. This is actually a lot of fun. I don't think I've reclaimed any lost innocence, but I am having fun. Still, I do have a bigger purpose in coming here. Sure, yeah, we want to recapture that childhood magic, but first, before we allow ourselves to really go down that road, since this is a movie set made by a production, we need to talk about the production. We really need to figure out... Okay, let's go back. Lord of the Rings movies come out, Jackson wins all of the Oscars, the movies make all the money, then the good times come to an end when Jackson and company decide that New Line Cinema, the studio that bankrolled and distributed the Lord of the Rings films, is holding out on them. So factor number one is Jackson's original lawsuit against New Line Cinema in 2005. To keep this short, this results in Jackson being booted from all things related to The Hobbit eventually turning into a feature film or several. A couple of years pass and then in late 2007, Jackson and company settle out of court and he agrees to executive produce The Hobbit movies. But Jackson does does not want to direct the Hobbit films owing to his commitments to Tintin and The Lovely Bones, although he does want to be involved along with Fran Walsh and Philippa Boyens in a producerial context. In Jackson's words, he's already spent three three-hour movies in Middle-earth and that was enough for him. The guy he wants to direct is Guillermo del Toro, who is fresh off the triumph of his Hellboy movies and especially a critical darling, Pan's Labyrinth. Also around this time, New Line Cinema merges with Warner Brothers in 2008. So in the grand tango of rights, this is how Warner Brothers acquired the rights to all things The Lord of the Rings, but not the rights to The Hobbit. See, MGM has those. And MGM has a problem. 3.7 billion of them, in fact, which was around the amount of crippling debt the studio had amassed around the time of the Warner Brothers New Line merger. Given this debt, MGM could not finance or even co-finance a blockbuster project. So, given that New Line and Warner Brothers were very anxious to create what would inevitably be lucrative movies based on The Hobbit, MGM and New Line brokered a ride-sharing deal for two movies, both directed by Guillermo del Toro. The year is 2009, pre-production is a go for del Toro's The Hobbit. I am exploding with the desire of just <laughs> showing everything. Del Toro was much more keen on The Hobbit than he was for The Lord of the Rings. His vision was to make the films both visually and tonally distinct from The Lord of the Rings, and to give them a more operatic, fairy tale like feel in contrast to the more grounded tone and aesthetic of The Lord of the Rings. Del Toro seemed to want to capture the whimsical spirit of the book. You don't have a committee. You don't have a group of uh, studio people telling you, there should be a happy ending here and they should never go to see the spiders or they, Bjorn is not uh, rating with this age group. But as we would find out later, that wasn't what Jackson or the studio wanted. Del Toro lived in Wellington for 18 months working on pre-production for The Hobbit before leaving the project in late 2009. And here, okay, here's where it starts to get a little bit tinfoil hatty, but bear with me. After Del Toro left, all parties involved cited scheduling conflicts and claimed that it was all taking too long. And Del Toro got impatient and wanted to work on other things, so he left. But given how quickly The Hobbit went into production after he left, to me, that reads either as a partial truth or a mistruth. In 2012, Philippa Boyan stated that Peter Jackson had to step up and direct for it to start making sense in terms of those financial models. But for Del Toro, the issue feels emotionally fraught. I have incredible heartache. I feel uh, terrible about it. It's very hard. It's getting a little easier to talk about it, but essentially it's like you've been recently widowed and everybody asking you uh, exactly how your wife died. Again, there may be partial truths to the idea that this was all just taking too long, but this does not read to me of a guy who voluntarily left a project he'd spent almost two years on because he was feeling impatient and wanted to fly free, little bird. Yeah, it was taking a while, but if you've worked in film, you know that 18 months of pre-production for a project this huge, it's not that much. There was none of this taking wonderful photographs in front of racks of armor completed a year before production as we did on Lord of the Rings. If you think about that time, there was incredible planning. There were three and a half years of pre-production before we rolled the cameras. And then there's the fact that when Jackson took over, those 18 months of pre-production got completely scrapped. Jackson threw out everything that Del Toro had done, which speaks to me that there was something about Del Toro's vision that was fundamentally at odds with the movies that Jackson and the studio wanted to make. But here's the thing, I don't think that the studio really knew what movies they wanted. 
just that they wanted it to look and feel like the Lord of the Rings, because they aren't shy about the fact that no department was given adequate time and there was effectively no pre-production. Peter never got a chance to prep these movies. You can't, I can't say that. But he didn't. You now have to plan on the go. You're laying the tracks directly in front of the train. And that chase does all the way to the end. The question to me is why? If they've already wasted so much time and money on Del Toro's pre-production, why not give Jackson at least a few months? The best answer I've been able to find is those financial models. Pre-production costs money, and Warner Brothers felt like they'd wasted enough. So the decree was to get it done, do it now, or we will find someone who will. At least, that's what it seems like to me. New Zealand is a small country. Surely if I poke around, I can find someone who can tell me what happened on the set. Or better yet, find someone who was actually there. This was the day, the last day that we were all, the core cast were all together. With the Hobbit and the uh, wizard with all the dwarves. And each one of us got one of these. Yes, my name is John Callan, and I've worked in theatre, television, radio, film since the early 70s. In The Hobbit, I played one of the uh, dwarves, and I played a character called Oin. He said he's an expert! <laughs> As I say, we kicked off uh, with tremendous enthusiasm, a real sense of brotherhood, camaraderie, and everybody working together. There wasn't one uh, toss pot person in the core cast. We really had a tremendous sense of brotherhood, of multiple different characters coming together for a single and very important purpose. And there was a determination within the cast that we would be a band of brothers, basically. There is, uh, I don't know whether all your viewers would know this, but it's a very common expression that the film industry is run on the motto, hurry up and wait. And there was more of that in this production than any other production I have worked on. We'd go through makeup and costume, prosthetics, that kind of thing, get ready and then wait and wait and wait. And it so happened that for a number of people, and it wasn't just the also-rans among us, um, uh, they wouldn't be used. And so we, at the end of the day, we'd been waiting all day, nothing would have happened, and we just went, oh, well, fine, at least I'm being paid, and the next day there'd be a nice bottle of wine saying, oh, thank you for being so decent about this kind of thing. And we were very happy to get those bottles of wine. Uh, as it went on, the bottles of wine ceased and the waiting got even longer. There would be the schedule on the wall and we would just put a little number up of how many changes to this schedule there would be within this week or this month. Then somebody would uh, you know, win a bottle of martini or something, you know, that kind of nonsense. The changes were incredible. Now, I'm not saying they weren't necessary, but they may well have come out of the fact that there had initially been the intention of using a director who had spent time prepping all this thing. And then Peter Jackson thought, well, if Guillermo del Toro has moved on to do um, the other work that he needs to do, I'll pick up the mantle. Other influences may have come from the studios. It's hard not to feel for Jackson and company. With the original director gone, Peter Jackson was put into this position where he had to do what the studio wanted. He couldn't pass the job off to someone who was really hungry for it. If he passed on directing, there was no reason for Warner Brothers to keep the production in New Zealand. So, with no other director and no time, Jackson had to do it. And he had to do it according to the time frame laid down by Warner Brothers. And he was also forced to defend their decisions. It meant that we had a second movie, like the middle movie, The Desolation of Shmau, where we could actually have a little bit more fun with it too. Uh-huh. We may never know, but effectively the cost of making three movies instead of two was not a huge jump. And there were more parties at play here than just New Line, Warner Brothers, and MGM with their billions of debt. There was producer Saul Sands, who also had a hand in the rights deal, and guess who else came to the feast? Yep, Harvey Weinstein is here too. So where The Lord of the Rings had one studio bankrolling the films, The Hobbit had 
five, either bankrolling or taking a cut. Warner Brothers, parent company of New Line, MGM, which owned the rights to The Hobbit, producer Saul Sance, who, having nothing to do with the production, didn't take his cut, and Harvey Weinstein, who reaped millions from the Hobbit movies. But according to the deal he struck with Warner Brothers, only the first Hobbit movie. No, he was not actively involved with the production, but he did take a sizable cut from the first film due to a deal that he had struck with MGM in the long, long ago time. So when you take into consideration all of these outside interests that had nothing to do with the actual production, but who were owed cuts of the first film, but only the first film, a tad excessive. Having three films instead of two doesn't seem like such a bad idea. And that was only one influence the studio might have had. They may, for instance, have wanted uh, less of the story of the dwarves with the Hobbit and more the story of the, the punch-ups, the fights, you know, the battles per se. Um, the idea of having um, a love story in there, which wasn't in the book. Whether one thinks that was uh, well thought out or not. Aren't you going to search me? I could have anything down my trousers. Or nothing. So as we set off making the first of what we thought was going to be two films, there was a really strong bond with very different um, aspects to each of these characters. As it went on, we kind of had the feeling that in fact there were one or two people whose parts were going to grow because they were young and good looking and feisty and all that kind of thing. We got left behind a bit. How much that was based on what was originally intended, uh, I'm not sure because we didn't initially have complete scripts for three films because initially there were going to be only two films. All I can tell you is that there was a definite feeling within the core cast that Peter um, was, if you like, uh, he wasn't the final arbiter. One certainly gets that impression. Just uh, look at this thousand yard stare. Changes to increase marketability in movies are inevitable, and no, of course they're not always evil, but in the case of The Hobbit, they kind of build up. Let's run through just a few. With The Hobbit, it seemed like Peach started to fall down the same technology hole that swallowed the likes of James Cameron and George Lucas. A big gimmick that the film was sold on was being shot in 48 frames per second 3D. One consequence is that the models and matte paintings they used in The Lord of the Rings looked like models and matte paintings in 48 frames per second 3D, so there was a much heavier reliance on CGI. They also couldn't use the forced perspective that worked so well in The Lord of the Rings. The mileage of 48 frames per second varies by viewer. Some people are more sensitive to it than others. Some people like it, for some people it gives them a headache. But where CGI is concerned, more frames means more render time and more computer power needed. Part of the problem with the visual effects was the lack of time the CGI artists had for a lot of these shots. Contrast how amazing Gollum looks. If baggins loses, we eats it whole. And the melting gold on a dragon. Yikes. One of these scenes got the time and care it needed to look photorealistic, the other did not. The real irony is that 3D 48 frames per second version only now exists in prints. You can't see it anywhere. If you watch The Hobbit on Blu-ray, you're watching it in 2398 frames per second, not 48. I suspect this is also why we got Uncanny Valley Dian instead of Billy Connolly in makeup. Dian even gets his own chapter in the appendices, and they pronounce it Dane for some reason. Dane. 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 This is Dane, Lord of the Iron Hills. They never explain or even acknowledge the decision to put Dian CGI instead of a guy in makeup like the rest of the dwarves are. Another marketability change, as we mentioned in the last video, is the inclusion of a bunch of characters from The Lord of the Rings that have nothing to do with the plot as writ in The Hobbit. Galadriel, Saruman, Frodo, Legolas. The arc they seemed to be going for with Galadriel was that confronting Sauron and doing magic battle with him drained her, and that's why she has to go to Lothlorien. Her strength is failing. Take her to Lothlorien. Which, I mean, okay. It's better than what they do with poor Legolas. Legolas should have been a cameo, which was like the one thing Pirates of the Caribbean 5 did right. 
because it makes sense that Bilbo and the dwarves would have run into him in Mirkwood. But because he was such a popular Rings character, they'd go ahead and bump him up to the main cast. And it continues with another Legolas problem we saw throughout the Rings trilogy. In Fellowship, he's just kind of, you know, cool and an archer. And by the end of Return of the King, he's basically like Spider-Man. In The Hobbit, Woof. So let's ignore Super Legolas. Let's talk about his character arcs. First, there is the mom. About halfway through the Battle of Five Armies, the movie drops this bomb on the audience. My mother died there. Okay. And during Legolas's last scene in the movie, we get this. Your mother loved you. More than anyone. Was that in dispute? So at a point in history, Legolas's mom died fighting. There was no grave. No memory. This somehow led to something of a falling out between Legolas and his father. My father does not speak of it. So what we get in the theatrical cut is a motivation with no consequence. We get a cliche mom dead, dad mad, kid sad situation in which the dead parent drives a separation between them so now they never have to really talk and the writers can focus on that sizzling hot love triangle. Legolas also says this at the end. I cannot go back. Like this five army battle or Angstrom, the dead mom, it's not clear, has tainted the mere idea of Mirkwood for him for some reason. And then Thranduil tells him to go find Aragorn. Find the Dunedain. There's a young ranger amongst them. You should meet him. He is known in the wild as Strider. His true name you must discover for yourself. Like Aragorn's true name is a password for a clubhouse. Also, Aragorn is like, what, 10 during the Battle of Five Armies? I don't know, maybe Arathorn needs a babysitter. But much more prominent than this is the love triangle arc. From a character arc standpoint, this does nothing for either Legolas or for the narrative. This could have been better set up for his distaste for dwarves as we saw in the Fellowship of the Ring. And my axe. Thranduil, I guess, empathically confirmed that Tauriel's love for Keeley was real. Why does it hurt so much? Because it was real. And wow, the greatest love of all time is now legitimized, and Legolas looks on sadly, but sympathetically. Instead, the focus at the end is dead mom. He doesn't seem to care about Tauriel or the dwarves at all. Certainly doesn't play up that prejudice that he's going to have to work on in Lord of the Rings. Just this amorphous, mom-shaped angst. Legolas's arc in The Lord of the Rings is mostly tied to his friendship with Gimli. It isn't just about learning to undo their prejudices against each other, but also serves as a microcosm of everyone coming together to defeat Sauron. And they sail into the West together. I well thought I'd die fighting side by side with the elf. What about side by side with a friend? This is real. But Legolas doesn't get it worst in terms of clumsy addition made presumably at the behest of the studios. That honor goes to poor Tauriel. She's torn between an elf and a dwarf, um, so I suppose for Toriel, size doesn't matter? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Evangeline Lily, I am so sorry. Uh-oh, we have a problem. Belladonna Took is the only named female character in The Hobbit, and she dead before the book even starts. So, what do? Hollywood doesn't like women because writing them is hard. I have walked there sometimes. Beyond the forest and up into the night. But they like women because they have money. And there's this idea in some studios that women won't see your movie if there's no women. But women in movies need a justification for being women. Or they may as well be men, am I right? So better give her a love interest or several. On the one hand, it's a bit unfair to compare this to The Lord of the Rings, where they didn't need to fabricate female characters out of whole cloth and instead just beefed up the parts that were already there. I am no man. But on the other hand, creating a character out of whole cloth that adds nothing, nothing, nothing to this narrative. Like, she doesn't help the dwarves escape, she saves Keely, I guess, from a problem that wasn't in the book, but he dies unceremoniously anyway, and she's sad and it hurts so much. Why does it hurt so much? So, so this, uh, this brings up the question of what is, what is worse, bad representation or no representation? We're gonna answer that question today. Just kidding, no we're not. 
And contrary to popular belief, this is not why these things get changed. It's not to make it more politically correct, it's a cynical move on the part of the studio to increase mass market appeal, one that I don't think was necessary to get lady butts in seats, nor do I think it fixes the underlying issue of the way that Tolkien wrote women, or in the case of Hobbit, didn't. Fantasy in general has a women problem, because history is patriarchal, and since most fantasy is based on history, authors want to write patriarchal societies, but they don't really want to think or go into how or why these structures came to exist. You think your life is worth more than this? On the one end, you have something like Skyrim, which is about as egalitarian as a fantasy world is going to get. There are, of course, the likes of Terry Goodkind and Piers Anthony, which I'm not going to go into here. And then you have works like A Song of Ice and Fire, where the patriarchal aspects of the society are both both acknowledged and integrated into the narrative consciously. And then, of course, the benign sexism of Tolkien, where women are fair maidens. Sometimes powerful maidens, like in the case of Galadriel, but we don't really get to see it because, you know, she's gotta restrain that. Eowyn gets her badass moment of awesome, but when Faramir reads her a poem, she decides she's done with being a shield maiden and becomes a good waifu. But more common in recent fantasy, at least fantasy written by men, is the version where there's an implied patriarchal structure given the utter dearth of women in positions of power, but no one really talks about it. And that angle, the one where there's kind of like a token badass lady, that's kind of how I feel they went with Tauriel's inclusion in these movies. And it's not just that she's there, it's that she feels so out of place. No one in universe ever points it out because Tolkien didn't really care, but women have pretty strict gender roles in Middle-earth. Women don't do battle, that's why Eowyn stepping out of her lane was worth remarking upon. Arwen's redesign in the movies already makes her character a little bit schizophrenic. As far as she goes is taking Glorfindel's role, which again, in my opinion, was a good decision, but it also sets her up as kind of like a battle maiden. If you want him, come and claim him. And they did originally shoot Arwen Warrior Princess at Helm's Deep, but then they cut that. Also a good choice in my opinion. Because that was what made Eowyn remarkable. She disguised herself as a man because she had to, because women don't do battle in Tolkien's universe. You know as little of war as that hobbit, when the fear takes him and the blood and the screams and the horror of battle take hold. Do you think he would stand and fight? So not only is shoehorning in this unnecessary character doing a disservice to the story, she does not mesh with the fabric of the universe. I do not think you would allow your son to pledge himself to a lowly sylvan elf. I don't know, maybe lowly sylvan elves train their women in the art of war or something. To be clear, my issue with all things Tauriel isn't because it's unfaithful to Tolkien, or because representation is bad, it's because it's a transparent and cynical move on the part of the studio. You create a female character that is completely out of place in her own universe for her to be the center of a love triangle that serves no purpose in this narrative. Not plot-wise, not thematically, nothing. Hell, the only female character that escapes the great love triangling is Galadriel. And even then... Come with me, my lady. Gandalf, I swear to Christ. In order to take this job, you have to promise me I will not be in a love triangle. I swear to God, this is what I said to them. And they said, we promise you, you won't be in a love triangle. Came back in 2012 for reshoots. And they were like, uh, the studio would really like to see. And I was like, here we go. Yep. The great love triangulation of Tauriel was a reshoot edition requested by Warner Brothers. And all of this mess was added in reshoots, a year after principal photography had ended. So if this romance feels tacked on, it's because it is. And sure enough, I'm in another love triangle. Tauriel's relationship with Legolas doesn't make sense. Thranduil expects them to get married. He's grown very fond of you. But also kind of hates her. You would allow your son to pledge himself to a lowly sylvan elf. No. She has no reason to fall in love with Keeley. There is no reason for these two to care about each other. Like, they couldn't even write in a bit about how he, like, saves her from a spider at the beginning or something, or she saves him from a sp I don't know, they had spiders. Studios say we need woms, but what do you do with women in movie? I don't know. Love Triangle when none of the characters even have a reason to like each other, I guess. Aren't you going to search me? I could have anything down my trousers. Or nothing. Oh, the burning passion. So we will probably never know exactly where filmmaker intent ended and studio mandate began, but a lot of the weakest aspects of the films, if not directly demanded by the studio, were at the very least encouraged. But the important lesson here is that all of these additions come at a price, and the price is what should have been the emotional core of these films. 
Bilbo, his journey, and his growing friendship with the dwarves, particularly Thorin. So speaking of callbacks to Lord of the Rings, Thorin, you notice that he doesn't really look like a dwarf? Gandalf. Thorin looks more like, well, Aragorn than he does Gimli. So both aesthetically and thematically, Thorin is something of a callback to Aragorn, since Thorin is the king what needs to reclaim his crown in this trilogy. In the pre-production phase, Jackson stated that he wanted the dwarves to be iconically dwarvish. Pete said to us, I want to be more bold. I want the dwarves to look like a race of dwarves from Middle Earth. But... Well, again, I'm not saying he was forced to do it. I'm just saying beards got shorn. Thorin looks like Aragorn and Keeley. Well, he looks like your anime boyfriend. The ones with the most screen time are less cartoonish and dwarvish and more Game of Thronesy and mainstream. That said, there are elements of Thorin's Aragornification that do work. Thorin's narrative in the book is that he's a very important dwarf who suffers indignity after indignity, and that's funny. This is where he's introduced in the book. And the book even mentions how annoyed he is that very important dwarf such as himself gets relegated to the pile. So I think the filmmakers found a good way to bridge this. Don't put him in the dwarf pile, have the other dwarves hella respect his prowess in battle. There is one who I could follow. There is one I could call king. And rather than making it a joke that this very important dwarf has to suffer indignity after indignity, have it be more about him regaining his honor by way of reclaiming his heritage. This is a good foundation for a character arc, but his arrogance is also a good basis for building a relationship with Bilbo. He has thought of nothing but his soft bed and his warm hearth since first he stepped out of his door. You don't have one? A home. It was taken from you. but I will help you take it back if I can. And I really like the dynamic they built between Thorin and Bilbo. And so does AO3, by the way. I was going to give it to you. Many times I wanted to. The problem, as with most problems in this movie, is when the restructuring does a disservice to the story, or when they go so far with a good thing that they don't know when to stop, jumping that shark from compelling to confusing and or boring. As I mentioned in the last video, moving Thorin's change of heart moment with Bilbo to so early in the narrative was a mistake. I've never been so wrong in all my life. Because there's no growth between Thorne and Bilbo in movie two. Thorne and Bilbo's relationship and its falling out is the emotional core of movie three. Diluting the movie with all the crap that we don't need and doesn't matter dilutes the emotional core. Another casualty of this is Thorne's death. Hell, Thorne dies before Tauriel's... Why does it hurt so much? scene, and both scenes are given the same emotional weight with both the cinematography and the editing. One of these scenes features a relationship that has been built organically. The other features a woman crying over a man she has no reason to care about in a studio-mandated love triangle. And the latter is given the greater focus because it comes last. I'm not saying Keeley and his wingman Feely don't deserve some sort of death scene, because yeah, we've spent a lot of time with them too, but that this happens... Why does it hurt so much? Because it was real. Immediately after this, robs Thorin's death of its gravitas and pulls the rug out from under what was naturally a cathartic and good farewell that had actual bones in the story. I am so sorry that I have led you into such peril. <coughs> well, I'm, I'm glad to have shared in your perils, Thorin. Each and every one of them. And I hate to bring out the tinfoil hat again, but I cannot help but wonder if Warner Brothers looked at all the gay jokes that followed the Lord of the Rings trilogy. I'm glad you're with me. And thought, we don't want that. No homo. It isn't difficult to tease out the stuff that worked, like Thorin and Bilbo, from the stuff that didn't like Tauriel and Keeley, Gandalf and Galadriel. On the one side are things that were there in the source material and just needed to be fleshed out. The other is made up out of whole cloth tacked on because the studio wanted it because the focus group said it tested well and it's less gay. So the emotional core, especially between Bilbo and the dwarves, the most important aspect of the films, suffers. In this movie, this is our fellowship, and they start out great. The strongest point in all three movies is at the beginning when the dwarves show up. The pines were But as the movies progress, they matter less and less until movie three ends with Bilbo just sneaking out. And the implication here is that the emotional core of the story doesn't really matter. 
even though we were in the core cast, we really did feel at some point that we were actually becoming the world's highest paid extras. Whether it had to do with the fact that the studios had said, actually, they're all right, these dwarves, yes, but the real stories are the battle between um, Thorin and the evil um, orcs. It's the story of the relationship between Radagast and Gandalf and finding Galadriel again and getting her help. If that is what the studios were pushing for, then they certainly got what they wanted. What I think they missed out on was the heart that we started with. And we had that as a group of dwarves going with Gandalf and with our hobbit to find our treasure. The treasure, like in the Maori language, taonga, has to do with the treasure of people, of history, and really of heritage. And that's what we were after, and that's what we as actors were driving towards, and that I felt gradually dissipated, until at the end we just had a big punch-up with five massive armies driven by technology. There is a lot more to it, but in the case of The Hobbit, bad studio mandates seem to be the cornerstone of the discussion. No, I don't necessarily feel better about The Hobbit, but that doesn't mean that the legacy of The Hobbit has to be all or nothing. I mean, just look at what it's done for the people of New Zealand. Clearly, they're proud of their ties to Middle-earth. There are giant stone dwarves at the airport. And this well-kept-up movie set staffed with enthusiastic people happy to show you around. Maybe these films were deeply flawed and often disappointing, but they were important to the people of New Zealand. These are a simple folk, just trying to get by in the global economy. So even if I can't appreciate the films, I can appreciate their legacy. Cheers. This was so much fun. Yeah. I think I can finally see that the Hobbit movies have done a great service to the country of New Zealand. In terms of legacy, what The Hobbit left behind is a little bit more complicated than that. I'm sorry, who are you? Hi, I'm Tom. I'm a writer for Birth Movies Death and a filmmaker. Um, just so you know, uh, what The Hobbit actually did for New Zealand was, well, it kind of fucked us. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, we've just been informed by the studio that this is actually going to be three videos now. The producers of The Hobbit are looking at shifting the film outside of New Zealand. But New Zealand's latest Hobbit movie is being threatened by an Australian union fight. Members of Actors' Equity meet and agree not to accept work on The Hobbit. All we are asking is for fair and equitable terms and conditions, minimum terms and conditions that our colleagues overseas enjoy. Why do most of us live hand to mouth and have to work in other jobs to make ends meet? It's not like that in other countries. Are you anti-union? Absolutely not. Do you hate actors? Absolutely not. Meanwhile, everyone goes apeshit. The sky is falling, the sky is falling. Let's go home. Let's go home. The dispute has forced US film giant Warner Brothers to look at moving the production away from New Zealand. And if the boycott goes nuclear, production of The Hobbit will move to Eastern Europe. Warner Brothers' key concern was industrial unrest. No one had even thought in a million years that this movie was going to leave the country. It is your moment to let your voice be heard and I know your message to the studio will not go unnoticed. To you, Warner Brothers, 
and you are going to make a fortune out of this film if you film it in New Zealand. So what we've got is the actors now in full retreat. New Zealand's Prime Minister has held a crisis meeting with Warner Brothers studio executives. Executives from Warner's fly in to nut out a deal with the government. So it now seems increasingly likely that the government will actually change labour laws. An agreement has been reached uh, between New Zealand, uh, the New Zealand government and Warner Brothers. New Zealand has saved its hobbits. To give film producers like Warner Brothers the confidence they need to produce their movies in New Zealand. What happened in 2010 to your memory? How was this framed to you? You know, The Hobbit kind of, in some ways, finished telling the story. It finished telling the narrative story, but it sort of finished telling the business story in a way. All right, this is, uh, this is a, a very political process. A uh, law was passed essentially to help tide studios over and bring them here that, in effect, uh, lessened the rights of performers. It was a law which controlled union activity. Um, it has essentially allowed people who want to exploit others to go ahead and exploit them, for actors especially, but also for crew. That began to take place pretty much after the Hobbit Law happened. I saw the Employment Contracts Act as being one that favoured employers to the point where employees were having fewer and fewer rights. Okay, so the more I learned about this whole Hobbit thing, the more complicated I realized it was. So uh, we've got a visual aid to help us understand what actually happened in 2010 and onwards. And yeah, so this is basically the story of how an American Fortune 500 company swooped in to exploit a labor dispute to the benefit of millions and also change the laws of a sovereign nation. They don't want extra subsidies, all this conspiracy theory nonsense about them wanting more money and more subsidies, no. Uh-huh. Well, first we need to understand why there was even a labor dispute for Warner Brothers to exploit in the first place. The Lord of the Rings trilogy was unique in film history. I was eight when Lord of the Rings came out, the first Lord of the Rings, and it completely uh, changed my life, to be honest. I still love them dearly, the trilogy. They still really mean a lot to me, coming back to them. Um, with the added element of being uh, something said in New Zealand, filmed in New Zealand, and whose New Zealandness uh, is kind of intrinsic to what makes it great. To a degree, those first Lord of the Rings films, especially, I would argue, Fellowship of the Ring, couldn't have been made anywhere else or by anyone else. I mean, Peter Jackson was very inspiring as someone, in fact, who could uh, make films, keep making films in New Zealand. So that was certainly a goal for me. Hi, I'm Jonathan King. I'm a New Zealand filmmaker. I've been in working in film for about 20 years, I guess. I wrote and directed a film called Black Sheep. I, no, I've, I've only worked in New Zealand. New, New Zealanders are very proud of Lord of the Rings and the Middle Earth thing, but also a little bit sheepish about it too. It's like, it's not all we do, you know? And it's funny how like Flight of the Concords, even if you think about the posters on the office wall, are uh, kind of poking fun at that straight away. So even New Zealanders are a little bit embarrassed about that. It's like, hey, we're not just scenery. What about another exclamation mark? I, I don't think that's necessary. The Lord of the Rings helped put the New Zealand film industry on the map in a big way. And part of the reason why New Zealand was an attractive location for filming was the unions were far weaker than the ones in, say, the United States. So, sooner or later, the actors of New Zealand, having helped create the magic of Lord of the Rings, were bound to start wanting at least equal treatment to their counterparts in England and the US. All we are asking is for fair and equitable terms and conditions, minimum terms and conditions, that our colleagues overseas enjoy. Yeah, good luck with that. When we have overseas companies, overseas production companies, overseas studios come to New Zealand and uh, I believe to Australia, they're doing it to save money. So this was sort of the, the world in which this whole fiasco exploded. I'm Rajneel Singh, I'm a filmmaker uh, and I've been working in the New Zealand film and television industry for the last 
12 years, I believe. By international terms, we are not really a film industry here in New Zealand. We are a film service. We do require these international productions to survive. Um, if we don't, the perception amongst the New Zealand film workers is that they're, you know, 90% of the people will just lose their jobs instantly and will not be able to continue working. Uh, going back a few years before The Hobbit, we essentially had a number of um, problematic incidents in our local film and television industry regarding um, how actors, specifically actors, but you know it applies to crew as well, have been treated by local productions. It was one of the elements that essentially had necessitated the formation of actors' equity and had started getting actors really thinking about organizing themselves and looking after themselves and fighting their own battles, which nobody else was fighting. Nobody in The Lord of the Rings, who was an actor working and living here in New Zealand, got any residuals from that. When The Hobbit came along, my understanding is that Peter Jackson was responsible for ensuring that we did. And that was the first major concession we had. That, I think, was a uh, a show of good faith by Peter Jackson, but clearly it didn't match the Screen Actors Guild uh, conditions of return um, because we were, you know, the troublesome group down at the bottom of the world who really should just know our place. So the local Actors Guild, backed, some might say pushed, by the Australian Actors Union, decided that The Hobbit might be a good high profile test case for us to bargain for better labor conditions. So let's do that. Uh, the first I ever heard about the industrial action, uh, which was sold to us as, a, as an industrial action that was international with English Equ Actors' Equity, SAG involved, uh, the MEAA in Australia and locally, uh, it was announced in the media, so during the press release, um, at which point all hell broke loose. Let's go home! 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 Let's... Why did you call for a boycott? Actors' Equity then releases a stop work order for actors who've been cast in The Hobbit until fairer pay conditions can be agreed upon. Tonight's meeting, New Zealand Actors' Equity members have overwhelmingly resolved that its delegation meet with the producers of The Hobbit to hold negotiations in good faith on the terms and conditions for performers working on the production. Isn't a boycott. It's not a New boycott. These are the lives of everybody in the New Zealand film industry. Why are you targeting The Hobbit? We have never said there's a boycott. It is not in any of our information. Warner Brothers really does not like this. It's a question of confidence in our industrial relations and the damage was done within a week of the blacklist going on. None of the other guilds that run the industry, crew, producers, directors, editors, were informed about this. So there was somebody in my extended family who came to me and said, you do realize, John, that by not signing, you're putting my work at risk as well. If you are working as a set builder and you've got somebody over here from America who is doing the same work and they are earning twice what you're earning for doing work that you are very good at doing, at least, if not a better standard than this other person, is that all right with you? The opposition to the industrial action across the board did not come from people thinking that you know, Actors' Equity was asking too much. It was nothing to do with that. It was a genuine, genuine fear of what Warners was going to do to re retaliate. The industrial action has the support of actors' unions around the world, and big names like Carl Urban come out in support of it. But local crews and Peter Jackson are terrified that this will scare Warner Brothers away from New Zealand altogether. And they are frankly worried because the actors bought a completely frivolous action. Now, if they've done that once, what happens in a year's time when Warner Brothers have spent 250 mil, they're halfway through, through the film and the actors decide to have some fun again? It's like it could happen all over again. They have no confidence. 
they then came back with the argument, well, we'll just go somewhere else. We'll go and do it in Hungary or Poland or somewhere like that. Social media exploded with fighting. And there were protests in the streets about what Actors' Equity was doing. Seeing uh, what a workshop st staff and Richard Taylor and everyone else marching down uh, the streets in, in Wellington. Now, the idea became, hey, The Hobbit's going to happen, but it could happen in Ireland or it could happen in the Czech Republic or whatever. And I think the New Zealand public kind of poo-pooed that and didn't believe, I think we felt such ownership of it that um, no one believed for a second that it would go anywhere else. And I think anyone <clears throat> who knows much about, I guess, about international filmmaking is that um, it could quite easily have gone anywhere else. There were these really nasty, divisive forces at work. That's what um, I was probably most unfortunate about the way it played out, is it went from one group pushing for better workers' rights, suddenly became, the film's about to go away, don't worry, if we just change these labour laws, now we can save the film. I think by that stage, equity had lost. And then politicians were like, hey. In New Zealand, there are two major parties, left and right. Labour had been replaced by a national or right-wing government. To encourage that business to come to New Zealand, the government of Prime Minister John Key um, had in place a tax trade-off. The impact of this will mean an additional rebate for the Hobbit movies of up to US $7.5 million per picture. John Key also happens to be a former Merrill Lynch executive. They did everything but r literally roll out the red carpet for Warners. Warner Brothers flew in on jets and met overnight with the Prime Minister. There were lobbyists that were flown down here. There were meetings, there were dinners. Suddenly the message became, we've saved the Hobbit in New Zealand. And the Prime Minister was able to say, I have saved, by just rewriting a few labour laws, I've been able to save the Hobbit in New Zealand. You couldn't tell who was more excited to meet who. The Warners were excited to have a, a state dinner with, with the leader of a sovereign nation, or whether the leader of the sovereign nation was excited about meeting, meeting some studio execs. It was. It was quite farcical if it wasn't so serious at the time. The government is determined to use the opportunity that The Hobbit Movies presents to highlight New Zealand as a great place to visit as well as a great place to do business. So John Key rushes legislation through Parliament clarifying that film workers are independent contractors, removing their collective bargaining rights, and also giving Warner Brothers tens of millions in tax subsidies and offset marketing costs. It's good to have the uncertainty over and to have everyone now full steam ahead on producing these two movies. This meant that they were making even more money out of it because they were paying us less and they had this deal going on. So I think it was a, you know, pretty, certainly cynical on, certainly cynical on um, the Prime Minister of the Day's part. It has to do with people with money making more money for themselves and blow you people down there. If you don't want to do the job, clear off, I'll get somebody else who does. Now, I have nothing against people making money, but what I object to is that they make money off the poverty of other people. They create poverty. People who work in the film industry are freelance contractors. Freelance contractors cannot bargain collectively. And inequity basically means uh, grossly unfair and immoral. And such contracts, to my way of thinking, are exactly that. I think the Hobbit law was one of the most dangerously iniquitous pieces of legislation to pass through our Parliament. This ties into a much bigger discussion about the way we consume media. When you discover that something like, say, The Hobbit was dogged by a massive fallout between one American studio, a sovereign government, and its people because an underhanded change in its labor laws was written to benefit one production to the tune of tens of millions, whether you like it or not, it becomes exceedingly difficult to separate the merry adventures of Bilbo and his dwarvish cabal from the fact that the films are a benchmark case in how to upend an entire film industry. The consequences from The Hobbit Law have been mixed. In effect, it kind of mirrors what we're seeing in movies as a whole. 
There are plenty of resources, but they are going to fewer and bigger productions, almost all of them international, by which I mean American. Production decreased, some even say withered, in the years that followed, in part because of bad publicity surrounding the law. But the New Zealand film industry did double their revenue in 2016, thanks to James Cameron's 27 Avatar sequels being filmed there. Absolute winners of this law is international film productions coming to New Zealand. So that's great in that it incentivizes huge productions to be here. But I don't think those incentives in themselves grow our industry. And I think we were, I think the New Zealand public was sold the fact that these incentives will also grow the industry at the same time. And I don't necessarily think that's true. You only have to go to the IMDb and search for American films shot in New Zealand and the list will shock you because I think people don't actually understand the sheer number of blockbusters that are shot here. So personally as an independent, a New Zealand filmmaker, an independent filmmaker, I would have I would love to have seen our own government finding ways to stimulate our own industry. These enormous productions in New Zealand and the subsidies that have brought these enormous productions here offer employment to an awful lot of people who are excited about working on those things. But we still have a situation where those enormous productions are few and far between. Essentially, international film companies and studios are coming down here, making films cheaper and being able to worry less about um, blowback for exploitation of, of workers than they are in LA. A thousand people had some sort of job that was related to the making of The Hobbits, and it was a capitalist, a catalyst for... There are a lot of artistic choices in The Hobbit that exist completely outside of the studios and the paratext of the law that also kind of cheapens Lord of the Rings in hindsight. Little details like Thorin charging to the Ringwraith theme, Tauriel and Keeley's poorly written, rushed relationship, Legolas and Gimli becoming friends is no longer kind of a first. Or the orcs what move in sunlight and cover great distance at speed. An army that can move in sunlight and cover great distance at speed. Wow, Fellowship Gandalf, that kind of seems like not a big deal considering you did not seem bothered by that very thing in The Hobbit. And the genuine disinterest the films have in characters that are actually in the books. Tying these movies in, both internally and in its marketing, so closely with The Lord of the Rings just cheapens both trilogies. It tries to replicate things from the trilogy without any of the soul or the uh, verve or the ambition of those ones. It becomes like a machine. It feels like a machine when you're watching it. It started to like dampen what was so special about Lord of the Rings. There's still these films that hold this extremely dear place in my heart. I can still quote it and like come back to it and cry my eyes out. <laughs> you feel differently taking them in now it's not that wonder it's it's nostalgia now i think it's natural that films with like huge impact and influence people critically reevaluate them later like that's natural like any film that at the time is regarded as great eventually undergoes some sort of cycle of reevaluation it's a case with the hobbit where these are films that feed off of lord of the rings so intensely that you can't help but go back to the source material and think like, hey, what went wrong here? In the light of the Hobbit films, people view Lord of the Rings, perhaps not negatively, but definitely in a far more critical lens. People see what has become overly saccharine or overly homogenized in The Hobbit, and it bleeds into Lord of the Rings because that's where it was established. That's where the seed was planted and grew. And it's a shame, really. It's a case of too much, no, like too many cooks spoiling the broth, you know, like there's too much Lord of the Rings in the world now. It's not to say that Middle Earth fatigue wasn't inevitable. Dildo baggins. <laughs> Most properties and genres go through cycles of boom and fatigue, but the genuinely soul-sucking and cynical way these movies got made didn't help. The Hobbit movies weren't an end point either. They were an opening act for all the ways we can run the world of Tolkien into the ground. And the only reason it hasn't happened yet is because the Tolkien estate clung to those rights with an iron fist. But everyone has their price, and now Amazon is producing the most expensive television show in history, based on the world of Tolkien, specifically The Lord of the Rings. Amazon has already committed a billion dollars to five seasons, all this less than two decades after an Oscar-winning trilogy based on these books. And the ironic thing? The island nation of New Zealand will likely have nothing to do with it. Our life experiences affect how we view and consume media. And it goes without saying that most of us change between childhood and adulthood. But the media we consume as children is made by adults who, intentionally or not, imbue media with their own worldviews. A child watching The Simpsons will watch this scene, 
Some things will be dealt with at a later date. If at all. And it will go completely over their heads. But an adult watching the scene knows the context, gets the reference. How many of you had to deal with being called a poo or that being referenced? As an opinion on the controversy the scene is referencing, expects others to have an opinion about it. But knowing the full context of an opinion being expressed is one thing. It's another thing altogether to learn that people who made your favorite media weren't being treated fairly. Once the films had been made and were being released, we were all invited to the opening in Wellington. The third one was going to be premiered in Los Angeles. At this premiere, there was no invitation sent to any of the New Zealand actors. And it could be that we had been somewhat overly vocal about the so-called Hobbit law. So a lot of people on Facebook were asking me, uh, oh, will we see you at the premiere, John? Will you be on the red carpet in Los Angeles? I then put on Facebook a little post that's saying, oh, by the way, for everybody who's been asking, the Kiwis haven't been invited for budgetary reasons. So no, I won't be there. Suddenly, I had people from the production company getting in touch saying, we understand you're really, really angry, but you shouldn't be expressing your anger on public media, you know? And uh, I said, well, hang on a minute. There was nothing in what I said that indicated anger whatsoever. I just said what I had been quoted from my agent from the studio. And they said, this isn't good for business, all that kind of thing. We're not happy with it at all. Next thing I hear is that we are going to the premiere in Los Angeles. Nobody from Warner's met us. Nobody from Warner's greeted us. Nobody from Warner's said anything to us. There was absolutely no contact with anybody from the studio whatsoever absolutely extraordinary and we thought boy we must really have pissed them off if that is not the case then I would be delighted to hear that people like Peter Jackson were fine you know the other actors the English actors the you know the big names they were all fine there was no problem there but nobody from the studio said tickety boo to any of us from New Zealand I've always been a big fan of Kesha. The music of her early years was a gateway for me letting myself like Top 40. I was a huge fan of her aesthetic, of this flagrant, shameless image. It was fun. It let you feel like being broke and young and partying all the time was aspirational. It felt like a pass not to care about the world, at least as long as her music was on. But then, years pass, and it comes out that... All of those party girl songs were made during years of emotional and physical abuse by her producer, that the party girl image was a construct that she didn't really have control over and maybe didn't even really like. And knowing that, in a world where otherwise I probably still would have played the hell out of those early Kesha years music, it just doesn't feel the same anymore. I want to go back to the way her music made me feel back in 2010, just unapologetic and dumb and glittery. But even though I want to, I can't. Cause you brought the flames and you put me through hell. Because I now I know the circumstances under which that music was made. And if you watch a piece of media, had an emotional reaction, whatever it was, and then learned that the context involved a certain level of exploitation, it changes the way you view the media, whether you want it to or not. Maybe Harper Lee's old age and deteriorating mental state were exploited by her publisher in order to knock out a quick sequel to an American classic before the door closed. Maybe Kesha's party girl image was carefully crafted by a sexually abusive, iron-fisted producer who had 100% control of her public image. Maybe a lot of the art you consume, or even that you love, only exists because a person, or people, or an entire island nation were exploited by more powerful business interests. But, that's capitalism. As actors, we understand that there 
are many ways of going about business. Whether we're talking about the practical financial aspects of our industry or whether we're talking about the business of what we as actors do within that industry. Uh, where rights for women, rights for workers um, start and end. And I think human dignity is really, really important. And I think that there are employers around the world who exploit people. That is why the Screen Actors Guild and Actors Equity in England, Australia and New Zealand, and we here are directly tied to the Australians, why we exist to look after the interests of people so that uh, we don't fall under the thumb of the bully boys, so that we, uh, we are respected as people and as artists and that our views are no less worthy because we haven't got fat wallets. Profit-driven exploitation doesn't always have the last word. Kesha is still locked into a contract with the label that enabled her abuser, but at least he's not there anymore. And there are elements of the Hobbit law that are up for repeal now that Labour is back in power, particularly the bit about outlawing collective bargaining, which to me is the most heinous part. But these are only half measures, particularly the Hobbit law repeal, which itself is no guarantee. I reached out to several people affiliated with the various New Zealand film guilds, but none are making comment to the media about the law until the law gets repealed. If it does get repealed, How do you go on when in your heart you begin to understand there is no going back? If you discover that a brand or a company, like a bank or something, did something bad or unethical, it isn't surprising. People just kind of shrug and go, yep, that's how banks roll. And maybe you'll close your account and go to a different bank. But the reality is that you probably don't care enough to even do that much, because unethical multinational corporations doing terrible things to people in the name of profit is just kind of the world. You don't have the brain space to care about all of them. We pay monopolistic cable companies for internet access. We have 401ks run by morally bankrupt hedge fund managers that we'll never know. We still buy iPhones, we still buy cheap clothes while paying vague glib lip service to the knowledge that people are being exploited somewhere so we in America can boss Siri around. In some ways we engage with a multitude of brands and corporations every day that someone somewhere is getting exploited by, often cruelly so. But media is different. Media is personal. Media is designed to provide an escape, to stir emotions, to inspire. The film industry is by no means the industry with the highest incidence of sexual harassment, but people care more about it when it gets exposed in the film industry because the film industry creates media that hits emotional nerves. And then when we find out that something we loved was made by someone who said or did bad things, it's like betrayal. When people ask whether it's moral to separate art from the artist, or in this case, product from the multinational conglomerate, what they're really asking is, how can I go back to consuming media like I did when I was a kid? When the most context I had or cared about was who the author of my favorite book was, or why I like this actor, or what Kesha's real name and birthday is. But as an adult, you're expected to be an ethical consumer of media, and it's somewhat inevitable that some people resent that, because consuming media the way children do is comforting. Consuming media like The Hobbit as an adult is complicated, and in this day and age, it's hard to do so innocently. And I totally understand wanting to return to that innocence. And I don't really have an argument against that worldview other than... That's adulthood. Well, I'm back.